because this is an old plane that didn't have a lateral adjustment, it's been tapped back and forth on the sides of the blade to line it up. So it's had some abuse. Not much, just a little. I'll need to get out the diamond plate and flatten this. That'll do for getting the rust off just to see what it looks like. Blade doesn't look too bad. I got some pitting back here, but by the time it gets back there on the blade, uh, it's gone so far there's not much blade left. So I, I don't think I need to worry about this pitting. The pitting that I usually concern myself with is if there's a lot of pitting up here and there's a little bit right about a quarter inch back but not a whole lot, and it's a quarter inch back. That's a long time in sharpening. Scrape off the cap iron. And this is just for visual and to protect the material. Uh, on the top of the cap iron, rust really won't have any effect on the plane itself. It'll still work just fine with rust on it. But rust breeds rust. It attracts humidity and causes the rust to deepen. It gives the water some place to nest in and be held against the surface and cause more corrosion. So I try and get the rust off. This is where the two blades were held together. And the water tends to pull in between the two pieces of steel. Capillary action just kicks it right on in. And this section is going to be pitted to beat the band. And I need to get all this rust flake off because that rust flake will cause problems with the mating of the two blades, or the, the cap iron and the blade, so that it doesn't tighten up. So I need to have all this rust gone. And once again, this is just the rough stuff I'm going to have to through here and probably sand this down. And I got a couple other irons in the fire and I don't want to take too long on this. I just want to see what I got to start with so I can plan out what the next step is. Too bad. Pitted. Nothing very deep. Yep, not too bad. This isn't anything fancy. It's just a stick that I stapled some sandpaper onto. Uh, it's an old belt off a of belt sander that tore and rather than throw it away or try and use it up in little bits and pieces I thought I'll just put it on a stick. I originally did it to flatten Bondo on a let's see what was it? It was a truck that I was working on and I needed to have what we used to call a banjo when I worked in a body shop which was a, a long flat sanding surface that gripped the sandpaper. It had two clamps, one on either end. 
and you grip the sandpaper in the bond in the banjo and you could go along and flatten out the body and follow the curves of the body. It was only supposed to be used as a finish tool. You weren't supposed to have to sand off any more than just a skim coat of Bondo. Uh, I worked with guys that thought Bondo was a, a uh, replacement for metalwork. And they would put on a... Oh, we had one car come in from... Uh, uh, I forget the names, but it had the names of the former owners. A uh, guy's name on the front, on the, the uh, sun visor on the left-hand side, and a girl's name on the sun visor on the right-hand side on the convertible. Uh, Ford Fairlane, nice-looking car. Painted red and white. Obviously the guy loved it because he painted him and his girlfriend's name on the visors, or on the, on the sun visors. But something happened, I don't know, maybe the loan didn't go through or whatever, and it ended up at the car auction. So one of the local car dealers bought it and brought it into our shop to get basically the 10 cent tour. Clean it up, fix it up, make it look good. Now on the way to our shop, they crossed a set of railroad tracks. And the left rear quarter panel fell off the car. I mean, fell off the car. There was a good inch and a half of Bondo on the left rear quarter panel. And since it was a fair lane, it had, I forget the year, but it had the curved body panels. It wasn't something that you could just go down to the local junkyard and find one. It was kind of a unique body style. So we spent about six hours laying Bondo into that body. Now you'd think that you just take the Bondo, you put it in there, lay it up, and you got a two inch thick piece of Bondo you got to fill, you mix up a big gob of it and stuff it into the hole and put in two inches of Bondo. Well, that's a sure way to have it fall out. That's probably why it fell out and it went across the railroad track. You have to lay it up no more than an eighth of an inch at a time. Two inches? That's 16 layers. That's a lot of time spent putting Bondo on. And you have to put it on and shape it, and then put it on and shape it, and put it on and shape it. And we were pretty good with the tools by then. We could lay it in and have it fairly smooth and straight and square when we were done. But still, that's a lot of bondo. And I didn't do the finish part of it. I got out of that, thank heavens. But the guy who did it made a mold of the right hand side of the car. No. He made a mold of the left hand side of the car because there was a small section still straight. And he used that to make basically a scratch mold where he could run that over the bongo and mold the stuff into shape. The next day when we finished that car up, it looked good. I wouldn't have bought it, but it looked good. So anyways, all that started because I started talking about a banjo. Something that I'm seeing as I just run this sandpaper over the edge here, they put a radius on that, a concave on the blade. That's really a, a pointless effort. All you're doing is weakening the blade. You really want to have it be at the angle all the way across the whole thing. 
A secondary bevel or a curved bevel just weakens the, the edge of this plane and causes it to go dull quicker. So I try not to do that. Okay, major rust is off of it. Knock the burrs off from where some ham-handed son of a gun beat on the edge of the blade. And when I stone this blade, I'll stone this too to match it. That's pretty good. 